This is like the first time I showed this TBR version. I had to cut down from the 80 minutes. If you're curious, if you want to find out more about this film, which screening this 80 minute full feature version on the DC Independent Film Festival, 5 p.m. on Saturday. So tell your friends. All right, well, advertisement is over. Well, thanks, Hal. I, I really, really enjoyed it. This is my second time watching it. I did watch the 80 minute one before. Oh, I had to suffer a second time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I truly really enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, but first, let's just make a quick round of introductions before launching. I hope you all enjoyed that um, movie very much. Um, um, what an achievement, how. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whatever. Really, hats off. I mean, yeah. you were following them for such a long time, and you managed to capture so much of what was happening. You know, three years later, and, and all their dreams and aspirations. But before we just launch into that, let's just quickly say who we are and why we're up here, aside from how. Um, um, maybe I'll just start with introductions. Um, my name's Mei Fong, and I'm moderating this talk. Um, I was a Wall Street Journal China correspondent, and I lived in Beijing for several years, and I'm actually writing a book about the one child policy. So I'm very, very interested in Hao's uh, movie and, and what it what it shows about the future of China. And um, to the lovely lady on your right there is Rebecca, <laughs> Rebecca McKinnon. Rebecca was also a New America um, f a fellow several years back. And um, she is now a director at the Digital Rights um, Foundation yeah, project. Yeah. project. But um, more to the point, uh, relevant for our discussion, Rebecca also spent some time growing up in China. She was actually there when they first launched a one-child policy in the 1980s. Rebecca also worked in China uh, in the 1990s when China's economy was just taking off, and she was a CNN bureau chief. And so she has seen quite a lot firsthand of some of the changes that have happened. And of course, last but not least is Hao Wu, who, who has created this wonderful gem of production. Hao is actually started off as a molecular biologist. That's <laughs> And so that's a long way off from you know making movies, uh, but you've made a whole uh, several really interesting documentaries showing modern China in all its different aspects. And um, in addition to that, you also had a different hat at one point um, working on um, China's internet uh, no. growth. So I, I guess I just wanted to start off very quickly in putting this. Um, what made you choose this topic and? this particular show. I mean, I, I, I love it. I, I think it's great. But I was just wondering what made you decide? Uh, to. I, th I think for me, it's like I, I, I was a biologist first. Then I was working in the internet industry, in business. But I always want to tell stories. And particularly for me, after living in the US for 12 years, went back to China 2004, the China I saw and the China I read in the media seems that there's a, there's a gap. You know, this not. You know, China is very complex as a Chinese, I know that. So I just want to tell China in the context of the globalization of cross-culture communication migration. So that's why I did my first film about Chinese-American, quote unquote, going back to China. Uh, what's their experience in China? What, did, what, what, what they saw in China? For this one, I guess I was um, looking for my second, this is my second film, feature lens documentary. So I was looking for a subject. And sometimes, as documentary filmmakers, you want to explore certain directions, but you don't necessarily get the right character or get the right access. So uh, I, I just heard a random chance through a friend that a Broadway producer is really working with Central Academy of Drama, which is China's own fame school, to try to help launch, really, musical industry in China. So one of the first projects they were doing, they were actually doing two projects. One is that they were bringing a touring production of AIDA to Beijing and Shanghai. And then the second production they're doing is this Chinese language production of Fame. So I was like, which one should I follow? Which one's more interesting? Obviously, the young kids, right? And also Fame being such a quintessential American concept. Self-made person, go after dream at any cost. So how does it translate in China, in today's China? So that's what, that's well, that was what got me interested in exploring the subject. Oh, well, I, I thought it was a great platform for exploring because of all the reasons. Um, what we know from, from growing up in of people in China is, is, you know, especially from the change from the Gaifu Kaifang opening up period to now was the emphasis on state safety and stability. And then suddenly you transmute to this whole generation where uh, people are chasing after something so ephemeral as, as fame. 
I was curious, Rebecca, what did you think? You grew up, you spent some time in China, you, you, you knew something of the generation at that time. Did you think this was a hopeful movie or, uh, or yeah, a sad I mean, movie? It was an incredibly hopeful movie. And, and of course, what's so wonderful about this movie is that you relate so much to these characters and, and you see you know, how much similarity there is between their aspirations and aspirations of you know, young kids here, you know, which is why that story, which is an American story, actually translates so well to those kids' lives. Um, but, but it's interesting you know, to, to, to kind of, I, I thought how did just such a fabulous job of juxtaposing this generation with their parents' generation, um, who are, their parents are closer in age uh, to, to me. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I was in China in primary school in 79 to 81. Uh, and I imagine those parents were probably born in the 60s. Um, I was born in the very late 60s, but I, I imagine they were probably more early, early to mid 60s, most of those parents. Uh, and their lives were very hard. They grew up through the Cultural Revolution, and quite a number of my Chinese friends, or my best Chinese friends, also grew up through the cult Cultural Revolution, which was a time when people were being persecuted for being artists. Um, and in fact, when, when I was there um, in 79, I, I was 10, and uh, I played the violin because I had the American, the, the kind of you know, Midwestern version of a tiger mom. So uh, I, uh, um, my parents arranged for me to take some lessons at the Central Music Academy at that time, which is sort of the classical music version of this school, mm -hmm. equally competitive. But at that time, because China just opened up, there was no rock music. Kids were, people were still wearing Mao suits. Mm -hmm. There were no tall buildings. There were very few cars on the streets in Beijing. Nobody wore jeans. You know, it was still, you know, there, there, it, it, was, it was a very different kind of society. It just opened up. The teachers at this school had just brought their classical music back out of, you know, hiding. Because during the Cultural Revolution, classical musicians were beaten to death. For, for being feudal, bourgeois. bourgeois. Yeah. Uh, and, and so there was this generation of people who had, had, you know, had no contact with the West and efforts to have contact culturally with the West were completely verboten for a, a period of, of 20 years during, the, you know, during that time. And, and, and people were just emerging from that in 79. Uh, and these parents of this generation had come of age at a time where nothing was certain, and you didn't know when, when they were having their children in the late 80s, those parents still didn't know whether this kind of reform and opening was gonna last. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you couldn't count on stability. Well, that's um, right. And, and, but these kids, they, it's, it's very funny because China, they know. They have no memory, no, no, no personal experience of how China was before it began to open up to the outside world. And haven't, you know, they, they still struggle economically, all kinds of things. The sort of fundamental, you know, kind of how the society works and what is considered good and what is considered bad and, you know, what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do or just the fact that you could actually have some control over your career. Uh, you know, up, up through the 80s, you know, during the, these kids, their teacher's generation, they had no choice over what job they were allocated when they graduated from college. Yeah. They had absolutely no choice. Uh, and, and so it's a very, very huge contrast. And, and I thought you did a lovely job, Thank you. you know, going back to, to these kids' homes uh, and, and so on and, and showing this, this contrast that the, these kids are living in a completely different China than, than their parents grew up in. Yeah. I think that was one of the great strengths of the piece too, because on one hand you're saying like, okay, this could be, like you say, you know, these are almost like American concepts. Be who you want to be, seek out, make mm -hmm. that, you know, strike out for the great white way. These are, you know, self determination. But on the same hand, if you were to make this movie in America, I doubt you would have such a strong presence of the parents in it, the way that you would here. I mean, what mother would travel all the way to New York and? Cook uh, meals for the uh, sun. No, some some millennials <laughs> parents yeah. sound pretty. They can be tigers, tiger moms, all kind of race, <laughs> you know, racism. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
1980 movie, I remember the Jewish mother was like <laughs> really prominent in that film. And I love that character. But, <laughs> yeah. well, but I guess one, maybe I was wondering if one of the questions raised, because one of the big questions um, that came about when China started this, the world's biggest demographic experiment in 1979 yeah. was, well, what is this one child generation going to look like? Uh, how are they going to shape the China of the future? And there were various theories which are still, you know, sort of being tested out. One of them being like, these children will, you know, have never seen the kind of want their parents have, and uh, they've had so much lavish to them, and therefore they are going to push for uh, greater change and have greater demands about um, political openness, maybe perhaps. Um, um, constant economic growth, all sorts of things that their parents did not have the choices, great choices, you know, yeah. with great choices, that it's almost bewildering. And the other theory, which is in a way, is like, which some of these um, themes are hinted at in the movies, they are too coddled. They are somehow crippled by the sense of perhaps too much expectations, too much sheltering, uh, not enough hard knocks, that somehow this is not going to be bode well for the future, that they can't take the hard knocks, they can't take the rejections, they don't want to be the bee cast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm sort of wondering, the movie kind of, to me, left it open-ended where it was at, and I'm just wondering what your thoughts on that path A, path B, cast yeah. A, cast B kind of <laughs> concept. I, I think that you, well, everybody has different perspectives. You know, for example, as a filmmaker, I would, my goal was to tell a good story. I, I want to hint all the conflicting views from you know from the teacher's point of view, from the kid's point of view, and let the audience come up with something they can think about. Um, individual as a person, um, I guess my view is actually more optimistic. I mean, there are this generation has so many problems, but at the same time, as I was finishing up this film, I was doing research online. I was doing research about the millennial generation in America. I was like, <laughs> wait, all the criticism that yeah. we have towards the American millennials is also very similar to what you would say of the one-child generation in China. You know, very caudal, too demanding, don't want to stay with their jobs for long, <laughs> right? So, I mean, so in a way, so, but the, I, so that's why in the end I tend to focus on the positive, which is these kids, unlike their parents' generation, they, they are experimenting with individualism. You know, like Chen Lei, the character. Regardless of what she chose in the end, she was like, I want to be a, be a big star, superstar. I mean, very few people could have said that uh -huh. a lot of generations ago. Uh -huh. But now she's like, yeah. I want to be like, um, I want to be an American Idol. And then you see other kids, Fei, the young kid who has the poet father, he really struggles. You know, he's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, a lot of the wonderful sound that got cut out from this version. In the original version, you hear him say, like, throughout my life, I've always been pressured into doing dancing, acting, and never know what I wanted to do. It's always about making my parents proud, right? But at the same time, you see him really hustles that I want to make it, I want to make it. So these are, the, to me, the generational shifts that's happening, that these kids are demanding to be like me, the me, myself, and I. So they're becoming the me generation. So people will say that's a bad thing, but I think for China, because we have all these conformist pressure, like being me is a wonderful thing. But anyway, that's just my personal point of view. But what do you think? Yeah, the, the other thing that really kind of, you know, I, I think uh, was striking was just the money that a few of these kids had. Yeah. <laughs> um, Check out the sneaker boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, and, and just the, the real class divide uh, amongst the different students there. Uh, yeah. I mean, in 79, everybody was equally poor. <laughs> equally. <laughs> and uh, it was, uh, except for the... And, and it was, you know, there were a few kind of sons and daughters of officials who had connections, but they were poor too, you know, yeah. but they just had connections. But now it's like the cash. The one percent. Uh, and and the, the contrast that that kind of highlights, I, I, I think that was quite striking to me as well. To me, the thing that struck me was when I watched this and I, the, I was wondering how many, these kids were actually in some sense the outliers for, for Chinese mm -hmm. youth as a generation to want to be movie stars. It's still a minority kind of thing. I mean, like what we read now today is like a huge overwhelming percentage of Chinese children now want to enter the civil service, yeah. safer profession, um, benefits assured. And um, because of the weight of the issue of 
the six eyes going into one. Uh, they, they were the spoiled emperors with all these, but at the same time now, time is reversing. They are getting older and their parents are going to get older too. And they are going to have to take care of those parents, which is why they're making, I think, most, I think, are making the choices. I'm going to have to save career. I'm going to, uh, I have so many old people to take care of. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get married early because my parents expect me to. I'm going to have that child, grandchild, because my parents expect me to. So. To me, that was the flip side of what I, I see. And I, I celebrate what your film does and the kind of people it is. Because to me, it feels to me like <coughs> the minority and not the majority. Of, yeah. of, of I, I agree. I absolutely agree. I mean, these are the 1% of Chinese school population. And they are by no means the statistically representative. I think what I'm trying to do is trying to find some themes that's mm -hmm. happening in China. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, as a filmmaker, you, you, you have to have a point of view. So, so I chose the point of view, which is three years later, they're still sort of fighting. You know, most of them are still trying to figure out what the future could be. And, uh, um, but you know, I've screened this film in Beijing, and young kids loved it. I mean, despite a lot of young kids might be going into other profession, but they have their aspiration. They have the desire. They want to be like them. They want to be like Chen Lei. Say, I want to go to America, even though Chen Lei didn't come to America. He's the rich kid who ended up coming here. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's this idea. This is this, the, 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 you know, the spark of what did Mao say? The, the, the fire can, can the grassland, whatever. I forget one. that one. Anyway, <laughs> Mao said something. You know, like Mao said a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How was the reaction? Um, and I'd love to open this to the audience uh, at some point to sort of gauge the reaction here and, and sort of compare and contrast with how that was different from, say, um, the reaction in China. But um, I was just wondering before we do that, whether what were some of the things, reactions in China when you screen a movie there that perhaps struck you as unusual or different from what you expected? I think the first, the biggest surprise was that I, I make this film, I want to. With the, with the intention of explaining China, a young generation. I want to tell people outside of China what young people, young kids are like in China. I wasn't expecting Chinese people to like this because that's what they see every day, other than the song and dance, <laughs> which is relatively new. But uh, surprisingly, I found it really resonated well uh, with young people there. It's, uh, like I said, I think this, this emotional angst, you know, the young kids are feeling so much expectation, but at the same time being pressured by everything that they cannot fully express themselves. That angst that I think maybe finds a lot of resonance in China. And right now we're discussing with a couple of national broadcasters about broadcasting the film. So, you know, I was nicely surprised. It was a great surprise to show this in China. You know, one of the things I was curious about was um, in the film was because I've been reading a lot of social scientists' research into what this one child generation means. And um, one of the things I read was, um, you know, there was one of these social studies recently done by um, Australian universities where they um, did some psychological tests. And their um, initial um, um, tr assessment was that um, the one child generation tends to be much more risk averse yeah, and absolutely. also uh, less prone to sharing <laughs> yeah. than the previous generation before that. So um, I, do you think that that's? true in the context of what you've been talking about in, in your film and, and in people you've met? Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't exactly look at this data. I definitely see. But for me, because as a filmmaker, I'm more looking at the characters and mm -hmm. sometimes the anecdotal evidence rather than statistic evidence. So I definitely can see from anecdotally and based on characters, there's the comes in both sides. Uh, I think it obviously has something to do with the growing up with no sibling. You don't have to compete at all to get your parents' attention, mm -hmm. right? You automatically get it. It's a lot. It's exclusive attention on you. Um, and secondly, they just been getting everything. They don't have to do anything. The parents just give, give, give. So that contributes to this, like, I'm just waiting. You know, I can work a little bit, but if I hit some bump, I'm going to withdraw. So to, in that regard, I think that's true. But at the same time, uh, you know, I know we're not supposed to do one hand on the other hand, but <laughs> China's been so big, the generation is like, that generation alone is 240 million, right? We're talking about the post-90s <laughs> generation. That's another 200 million there. Oh, so within generation. these millions, the guy was find a million that's yeah. really like going <laughs> the out there. there. <laughs> like when I was working yeah. in the internet industry in Beijing, my kids, the young kids I hired, 
They're like, I don't like my boss. I'm going to quit. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? I'm going to travel for a month. Then I'm going to come back look for a job. Like, that would drive me nuts. I said, don't you want to do a career planning? No, I can't find a job. I'm OK. <laughs> so you can see that's like, I don't know whether that's risk averse or risk seeking, because they're just like, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Yeah. That's interesting, uh, the, the, the issue. But then the other hand, there's always the, the parental expectations which play to it. And one of the big issues is marriage, right? One of your chief characters, Chen Lei, who is a very attractive and engaging character, she's wrestling with, should I get married? Or yeah. should I pursue a career? And you know, I think if you took that in American context, very few kids, you know, upon you know graduating from college, would start thinking very seriously: I need to get married or not. Oh, there's you know? a lot who do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, who here wants to get married? <laughs> well, oh, you I don't know. know. I mean, let's <laughs> let's open this up to the audience because I always find that to be yeah. really fascinating. Does anybody have some thoughts or comments on how they found the film and and any questions they might want to raise? This is actually a question. Mm -hmm. actually. Um, it seemed to me when I was watching the film that I kept on forgetting that these kids are in their 20s because they seem to be acting quite mm -hmm. young, like yeah. teenagers. I was wondering if that was a kind of a component of being in drama school and that's just the environment of the college or if that was like more of a cultural thing or what were your take on, take on that? I will probably, anybody else in that generation can answer here because based on my observation, you know, even like Chinese in their late 20s in working in a corporate environment, when they're outside of the office, sometimes they behave like this way too. Like with friends, with friends and family, that can be really relaxed and, um, you know, I, I think that's, the being in drama school in a, such a close environment, you know, spending four years with only 30 classmates, that contributed to it, that definitely contributed to it. But I think compared to the American, young people at the same age, Chinese people, I think they're more within their own circle. Yeah, and there. again, it's down to the family structure, right? That's right. You they're know, looking for extended family outside mm -hmm. because they don't have siblings. So when they have friends, when they have cousins, they really treat them like family, so they behave really Yeah, funny. because I think your comparison of norm is the American structure, which is actually very different. I grew up in Malaysia, I, I worked in China, and then I came to the States. I went to the States for grad school. I also taught many Chinese students as well as American students here at in universities. And uh, one of the main things I struck was the American structure pushes you to independence at a very early age. Mm -hmm. One of the first things you do as a as, um, self-determination is to drive at the age of 15. Now that changes your whole mindset because you can go somewhere. You have power over where you go. Your average American teenage, uh, Chinese teenager does not maybe get a driver's license until well into their 20s. Now that whole changes their whole mindset. I can go anywhere. So this is the American mindset. I get a car, I can drive, I can you know, hit the open roads. Um, Chinese mindset is I get into a bus or a subway stop and I'm driven somewhere. <laughs> like when his mom moved to, moved to Beijing, has been just taking care of him, like taking care of uh, early teens, right? Like a young kid. Yeah, they're being cuddled. You know, it, but that's not unique. I know a lot of college students, their parents moved to near their you know, colleges taking care of them. That ha that's happening in the U.S. as well. Sometimes mm -hmm. when they come here for grad school, the parents will come too and buy our, house, buy our apartment like in New York City. Which but is also, crazy. I think there was what is interesting about your movie was the, the play between school and a, a much more fluid structure of stardom, right? The pursuit of stardom is not linked to the certain kind of things you go to school, you pass exams and you graduate and bingo, you're a star. Yeah. But that is the, uh, the, the very structured way that um, Chinese school education has been for thousands of years yeah. and you know you pass exams you go to the next step and and you you know Chinese teenagers we all know struggle through the Gaokao which is like the you know like SATs a billion times over the pressure yeah, so with intense. all those scores <laughs> on that blackboard and study, and, study yeah. and the expectation is if you made it then you you made it you know you you do it so for them to do and try and and, and pit their hearts against stardom which isn't a question of graduating in the right school, even though they are in the right school, but there's no guarantee, right? And that's the heartbreaking thing for some of these kids because they're so disappointed. Yeah. You know, they're like, I went to this amazing school and, and why am I not a star? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, more people? Uh, the lady at the back with the hand raised. Yeah. Yeah. Um, great film, I really loved it. Um, I'm curious about um, how did you get this amazing access um, and how did you choose the characters in the film? And what was the process like working with your editor, Jean, to really shape the story? 
Oh, that's a lot of questions. So first, <laughs> first of all, getting access without the American introduction, I would not, I would never have gotten the access because in China, any state affiliated organization that's super secretive, right? You cannot allow a film crew there roaming, you know, on, 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 on a monitor. But then because the American producer introduced me, they were like, oh, he's a guest of the American producer. We cannot say no to Americans. So in that way, I was really lucky. Uh, your second question was how I choose this five, choose this five character, because very early on we know we want to follow Chen Lei, who really is like, I want to be superstar. And Fei, who's very articulate about the pre family pressure he's struggling. And then we build around these two characters, because Wu Heng kind of represents this kind of coddle, um, very talent, you know, talented, good looking. He should make it in the system, but he's not making it. So in that way, that's typical of China, too, because he's like, People from my my family background would not make it in China showbiz. He just he lost the battle. Like, once he get into this college, right? So that's kind of typical of the cynical Chinese. So he's a very cynical Chinese. But and then the other two, obviously, as contrast to Fei, as Wu Heng and Chen Lei, you know, the rich kids, right? So the three main characters followed up all poor kids somehow just happened, and they didn't get an A cast. But the other two are rich; they got an A cast. But in terms of Gene, working with Gene's there, like I said, like a filmmaker recently said, filming a documentary is like selective vacuuming. You just vacuum, you know, as much as you can. But films are made in the editing room. I mean, in the editing room, working with Gene, now I know who you are. Uh, and then <laughs> it's really about finding the theme, highlighting the theme, because there's so many ways you can shape the story. I can make this about Americans coming to, to China. China doesn't um, understand America, cross culture differences. Mm -hmm. I can make this about corruption in a school system. You know, the kids I hinted on, the kids are kids at school. You know, I, I can make this about an underdog story. But then we decided to say, okay, pl based on the footage we have, we want to tell a story about this young generation, their struggles. Thank you. We have room for two more questions, I think. Could you, could you talk a little bit about the, the China's uh, musical industry? Um, I mean, these kids are majoring in musical. Um, is there any big changes um, in the past years? Um, is there a new major in the academy? Thanks. Uh, musical industry. That, OK, that's a difficult one. You, and there's a great Atlantic actually read, read an article around this film of talking about the music industry in China. Um, uh, really briefly, Mama Bia uh, had a sold out perform so that wrong in Shanghai. So that's a good start. But in terms of really for Chinese people to understand the musical form, our form, it, it, it's going to take, I don't know how many decades, at least another one or two decades. In, in, and then for China to have really the talent, the talent to write good musicals and performing great musicals, is going to take another two decades. Because we, we all hear about China talking about innovation. And these kids, you know, they have ways to go. They have ways to go to meet the Broadway standard. Yeah. Well, I also think that one of the things China will probably need to develop is the audience, right? You know, the so audience going to sit through the yeah. thing and not rush for the. the, the, the That's the, right. But um, I'm sorry to say we're run out of time entirely. Uh, but you guys have been the great audience that we want China yeah. to develop. So um, if you have any further questions, I'm sure Howard would be happy to talk to you after this. Yeah, and we'll we be outside. Get drinks and yeah. drinks. Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.